Hey everyone, welcome back. Um, so this is chapter 8 solutions from the workbook. So if you have the workbook, I am just going to get right into it. So first things first is identifying blood vessels. This question is very important if you are preparing for the exams because usually you will get um, an image like this or you might get it either when you are doing paper one, two or three sometimes depending on what you're doing. Um, so please make sure that you note that the one that has the larger lumen is the vein and the one that has the narrow lumen is the aorta, uh, the artery, sorry. It's the artery, the aorta, the aorta is a type of artery, but it is not the only artery, obviously. Um, so always bear that in mind, because I see that sometimes students also confuse it because they're like, oh, this one's wider. It must be like the artery, because the artery is super important. Well, veins are very important too. Um, and then the question goes, why does A have a wide diameter? So why does the vein have a wide diameter? And that is because it carries low pressure blood that is deoxygenated. So the blood that is flowing through the veins is not high pressure blood and I think when I explain this in the classroom if I remember correctly I would often tell the students whenever you go to get like a blood test and they want to draw blood from you they always say they are looking for a vein they don't look for an artery because if you burst an artery that person could die it's high pressure so the blood is just going to spread out and splash everywhere the blood in the vein, on the other hand, is very low pressure blood. It's just flowing back towards the heart very slowly, very chilled. So you can take blood from a vein and not have um, the, the possibility of a person bleeding out and dying, right? So that's why those two are very important. Okay, what are the characteristics of B that make it suitable for its function? So that would be the one that we just saw, which is the artery. And that's because, first of all, it has very thick walls. If you look at that image again, so you can rewind. It has very thick walls and it has a narrow lumen. So if you want something to travel at high pressure, then you need to restrict the space, the diameter um, through which it is traveling, the diameter of the medium through which it is traveling, so that the pressure can be more, right? If it's a lot of if the diameter is large, then there's not, there's not, there isn't going to be enough pressure exerted on whatever it is that you're trying to move. Okay, some quick fire questions. Which side of the body does oxygenated blood flow through? It's on the left side because remember the left side of the heart is where the aorta is and the aorta transports is the largest artery in the body. It transports oxygenated blood out of the heart. Always remember that arteries carry blood away from the heart and veins carry blood towards the heart. So the blood leaving the heart flows through the left side of the body and the blood returning to the heart will go through the right side. All right, which blood vessels have the smallest diameter? Those would be the capillaries, they're very tiny. Which blood vessels carry deoxygenated blood to the heart? That would be the veins. But if you're speaking specifically about one, like the biggest vein, for example, that would be the vena cava. All right. Oh, that's a question here, actually. So I've already answered the last question. And what is the largest artery in the body? Again, it is the aorta. Then here, state the characteristics of erythrocytes and lymphocytes below. So um, I don't think this should be lymphocytes. It's actually leukocytes. I'm so sorry. I've just realized that this is an error. Um, the lymphocytes are the immune cells. Well, yeah leukocytes lymphocytes okay i'm not really sure by the way i'm recording this video at like 5 30 a.m in the morning so <laughs> i might be wrong but um let me not delete that i just know that there's a word leukocytes that's popping into my head and i'm not really sure if it should be leukocytes or lymphocytes but please check on that but basically i'm asking you for the characteristics of red blood cells those are the erythrocytes and the other one, which name is now in question, is um, are the lymphocytes, all right? That would be your white blood cells. So erythrocytes are biconcave shape. They don't have a nucleus. They don't have a mitochondria or an ER. Um, that's an endoplasmic reticulum. They are flexible. Their main component is hemoglobin, and that's what makes them suited to carry oxygen around the body. The lymphocytes, on the other hand, are more spherical in shape, and sometimes they can be irregular. They do contain a nucleus, and some of them have, um, I think, an endoplasmic reticulum. Um, they are concerned with immune functions of the body, so some of them generate antibodies, um, which are proteins themselves, and they use um, phagocytosis to combat foreign antigens. They 
um, alert the immune system. They have all kinds of functions. There are so many different types of them, but these are some of their characteristics. Hemoglobin is well known for its function as an oxygen transporter, but it also plays a role in the transport of carbon dioxide. Explain how CO2 is transported and refer to the role of hemoglobin. So CO2 in the body is, um, is quite an interesting thing because you expel some CO2 out of your lungs, but not all of the CO2 that enters into your body leaves. Well, but not, not all of the CO2 that is made in your body leaves through the lungs, not the CO2 that enters into your body. Hopefully you're not inhaling CO2. Um, CO2 will then react with water in the body to form what we call carbonic acid. And the enzyme that oversees that reaction is carbonic anhydrase. I would say that if you're answering this question in the exam, that you should put that reaction there. And if you don't know what the reaction looks like, by all means, just check out my chapter eight videos. Again, you can go to playlists on the channel and just scroll down until you can like until you find chapter eight and just click on chapter eight and all the videos under chapter eight will play. Okay, that's a that's an easy way to study. You want to study chapter eight in like less than 30 minutes. That's a good way to do it. But I'm pretty sure it's probably more than 30 minutes. Let's say less than an hour. So when this reaction happens, we will have um, a surplus of hydrogen ions. And you already know that whenever you have hydrogen ions, that means that you have an acidic pH. So the blood is at risk of being the blood is at risk of being acidic. What hemoglobin will do is it will act as a buffer. So hemoglobin is not only just about oxygen transport. It also tries to make sure that the pH of the blood is fine. So it will act as a buffer and it will bind to those hydrogen ions in order to reduce the acidity of the blood. In, that, in doing that, it forms what we call hemoglobinic acid. And hemoglobinic acid is usually written as HHB, which is basically hydrogen ions bound to hemoglobin. When you have HHB, it is unable to bind to oxygen. So it will dissociate itself from oxygen, um, thereby reducing its oxygen saturation and continue to work until the pH of the blood is stable or is at a pH that is proper, right? So in during that, during that time, what you will find is that there isn't like, there, it's not binding to oxygen as well or as much as it can. What this effect is called um, is the Bohr effect, okay? And on the next question, I'm going to explain this in a bit more detail, but I hope that that was clear. Again, if it wasn't, just check out the chapter eight videos. So the Bohr effect is an interesting thing because it basically is measuring what the hemoglobin saturation is um, of oxygen at different CO2 concentrations, okay? So let's say the, um, at different pressures of oxygen rather. So you would expect that the more available oxygen is, so you can see here when oxygen is zero, saturation is also zero expectedly. And as oxygen increases saturation, if you look at this first graph here, I'm going to use a blue marker so that it's distinct. If you look at this first graph here, um, saturation continues to increase until it plateaus, right? And the reason why it plateaus is possibly because all of the hemoglobin has been um, saturated, has been bound to oxygen. So even if you continue to increase the oxygen, it doesn't necessarily increase saturation, like because there's no more hemoglobin to take up the oxygen. So think of this in terms of enzymes. And this is why the chapters that you study, the first four chapters of AS biology, teach you everything you need to know about the rest of biology. So think of it in terms of enzymes and substrate concentration. If you continue increasing substrate concentration to a certain point, the enzymes all get saturated. So no matter how much more substrate you add, the rate of reaction is not going to increase because the enzymes are saturated. It's the same way. Um, so you can see that. However, um, and this is for low CO2 concentration, obviously this curve is a little bit different when there is no CO2 at all. Now, when you have your normal CO2, you can see the saturation decreases somewhat. So let's say, for example, at 20 for low CO2 concentration, at 20 um, partial pressure, 20 millimeter mercury of oxygen, um, you have like, let's say 30% saturation. The same 30% for normal CO2 only seems to happen at around 25. Well, not really 25, but maybe let's say 24. Do you understand what I'm saying now? So it means that um, even though the um, partial pressure is there, because the oxygen is, because there's now CO2 present in a higher concentration, the hemoglobin is not binding as much. 
So with a high CO2, if the CO2 is high and hemoglobin has to do a lot of work, for you to get a 30% saturation, you need about 30 uh, millimeter mercury of oxygen. So this is what it means, that whenever CO2 is present, it causes hemoglobin not to bind to oxygen as well as it can or as much as it should because the hemoglobin is busy trying to mop up the excess um, hydrogen ions from the conversion of carbon dioxide to carbonic acid. So that is the explanation for that. Okay, this is the last slide. How does carbon monoxide affect the transport of oxygen by hemoglobin? Carbon monoxide binds to hemoglobin irreversibly. So once it binds to hemoglobin, hemoglobin is not able to convert it to anything or anything like that, and then hemoglobin is not able to take up any oxygen. And this is why like you would find that if people are locked in a room where there's a high concentration of carbon monoxide, it can be lethal because their hemoglobin basically stops transporting oxygen and that can lead to death. Um, what happens to a person's red blood cells at high altitudes and why? Whenever you have, like if you go hiking, for example, and I used to do this a lot when I lived in South Africa and I'm hoping to take it up again. Um, when you go hiking and you go to high altitudes, you will find that the air is thinner which is what makes hiking difficult because people start to breathe really hard because there's less oxygen. Um, what the body does for people who live permanently at high altitudes is that it produces more red blood cells so that there are more cells that can capture whatever oxygen is available and that way it is able to keep the people alive. So yeah, that is all that I have for you for this chapter and I hope that you have found it helpful. The next sections will follow very shortly.